Welcome to the Sustainable Development eTalk series co-hosted by CNS and Indian Institute of Management Indore. We are indeed very honored to have with us a very special guest, Ila Gandhi. Ila ji is a noted peace activist and former member of parliament and former vice president of Natal Indian Congress in South Africa. Uh, she lives in Durban and she carries a heavy legacy on her shoulders. She is the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi. I have had the privilege of meeting her personally in 1916, uh, sorry, 2016, at the Gandhi Phoenix uh, settlement in Durban. Uh, she will share her insights on sustainable development, a holistic approach with reference to Gandhian ideas. And uh, Ilaji, today I was reminded of a book which I had read several years ago, uh, Small is Beautiful uh, by Shoemaker, a British economist. And I was really impressed by that book and Shoemaker was greatly influenced by Mahatma Gandhi and Gandhiji's concept of economy of permanence and appropriate technology. Uh, in fact, he has described Gandhiji as the greatest people's economist. So today, mm -hmm. with you presenting this talk, I was reminded of that book, which has been, I think it has been one of the 100 best books written after World War II. Uh, that has, it has been rated as that. And there's a lot of reference to, I think, what you're going to share with us today. Uh, so over to you, Elaji, now. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure and um, I'm grateful to you for inviting me because one of the things that uh, I want to do uh, is to, uh, you know, relate to the youth of today. So I think that, um, you know, ma many of the young people have sort of been alienated from Gandhian thought. And I think that it's very important now for us to interpret Gandhian thought in a way that it uh, is attractive to the youth. And so in whatever I'm going to say, uh, this is what I would like to focus on that, you know, the youth should be attracted to Gandhian ideas. So one of the things, you know, that um, I also came across is that Gandhiji, throughout his life, worked with young people. It was the youth of India that came to him and uh, volunteered their services and um, worked with him throughout his life. So if he was able to attract youth during his lifetime, there must be something wrong with us, the Ghanaian followers, for not being able to attract the youth in our lifetime. And this is what uh, I want to also focus on. So in looking at Gandhiji's holistic approach to life, I want to cite examples from his work at the Phoenix Settlement Ashram in South Africa, in particular, the one that you visited in 2016. Um, Gandhiji was no academic and would not write any theoretic uh, work that can convey in scientific terms his ideas and experiments. Yet he called his life experiments with truth. Truth I would define in this context as being an understanding of life and the universe we live in. So within that context, we can see all the sustainable development goals that have been uh, looked at by the UN and by the world community. But in this uh, particular talk, I want to focus on six points. The first one being what is a holistic approach? What do we mean by a holistic approach? And I define it 
as looking at things in their totality and not in little parts. As science and technology progresses and refines, the tendency is to compartmentalize each aspect and move away from the holistic approach. That is the modern approach. So we specialize and study one aspect of a discipline. Examples are, you know, you study human resources development, you study statistics, um, you study economics, you study business, and each of these aspects become single aspects, single disciplines. There is merit in this. I'm not saying that there isn't merit in it. We specialize in this one discipline and one area of work, which is good and undoubtedly gives value to what we do. But a holistic approach, which Gandhiji recommended, shows us how to look at the spe specific um, in the context of the totality. So you look at that specific in the total picture, not as just one aspect, which is what we often do. And when we look at this, then the perspective broadens and we begin to see things differently, simply because we now see how what we do in business impacts on, for instance, one little animal life in a remote area, which we neither know or uh, even thought that the ripple effect of what we do can actually impact on that little animal somewhere far away. So this is just an example. <clears throat> in the same way, uh, each of our actions affect other things in life. And I think we need to be conscious of that. This, and that, this is what Gandhiji said when he went to Phoenix Settlement, where his first experiment started. This is what he looked at. So his life at Phoenix was a holistic life. And I'll go on to describe that later. But my second point is that he looked at body, mind, and spirit approach. The body, the mind, and the spirit. Gandhiji began to study health issues and looked at alternative forms of healing. In his study, he discovered that modern medicine was intent on providing symptomatic care and not looking for causes of ill health, nor looking at effects of the medicines given on other organs or other systems in the body. So he therefore began experiments with a holistic approach to healthcare and favored, for instance, nature cure and so on. And these are the experiments he carried out at Phoenix, trying to look at how the body can be healed through looking at the total body and not just the symptoms that we observe. A small uh, example is if you got a headache, you take um, aspirin or dyspirin or something to relieve the headache, but you don't go and think of why have you got a headache and what is the cause of that headache you would be doing a long-term treatment of your body if you look for the cause and dealt with the cause of the headache. So <clears throat> this is just a small example of the way Gandhiji developed a holistic approach. The third thing that I have um, thought of is the interdependence of humanity and environment. And when you talk about Small is Beautiful and Schumacher, he concentrates on the environment and how um, interwoven 
our life is with the environment. So at Phoenix, he became very aware of environmental issues and the impact on our health, on our body in relation to the environment. So he looked at hygienic ways to remove waste, for instance, how to conserve water, how to ensure that the soil is fertile and that the fertility of the soil is not destroyed by us through our, you know, interference. And made numerous experiments towards this end, including the planting of hundreds of fruit trees at Phoenix. I think you might remember the many mango trees that we have at Phoenix still. And those were planted by Gandhiji and uh, he planted other fruit trees there as well. So that's the third point. The fourth point I want to make is that the spirit or religion and faith play an important role. And this is something that Gandhiji also began to realize at Phoenix Settlement. He, he, in South Africa and starting in London, when he visited London, he began to study the scriptures of many faiths. And he studied the writings of philosophers such as Tolstoy and Ruskin and later Thoreau. Thus began his own spiritual journey. So when he wrote my experiments with truth, he looked at his spiritual development and found that all his actions were in fact very strongly influenced by his spiritual beliefs. His faith in God became stronger while he lived at Phoenix Settlement and thereafter. He began to refer to the inner voice, <clears throat> which is his spiritual being and began to see that everything he did and everything that happened was through God's grace. He became an instrument of God. Again, we see the holistic view in this, the mind and spirit, each taking on a significant place in his life and work but also a significance that is a message for us today as we grapple with religious fundamentalism and all the violence and wars that we see in the name of religion. Gandhiji's message became or becomes even more clear when he said that our religion is based in love Everything on earth and the universe in, is God's creation and we should cherish and not harm and destroy each other or our environment. That is the basis of our faith, not the rituals and dogmas that we think is our religion. For him, it was this belief, this love, that uh, cherishes all of us and gives us life. That is the most important part of all our religions. And it is included in every scripture. Love is the central point of every single scripture, every religion. So that was his understanding of religion. Now the fifth point I want to make is knowing, appreciating and empathizing with the other. This enhances our own work and understanding. So this was a very important aspect of Gandhian teaching. The fact that we should get to know others and know their views and fears and prejudices so that we can then blow the myths and look at the essence and find the common ground between us and the other. It's the only way that we can live with each other and find each other if we can know, 
appreciate, empathize, and begin to say that there is much more in common between us than there is differences between us. And perhaps those differences are more imagined than real. So we can begin to look at what are our imaginary differences and what are the actual commonalities between us. And my final point is that an enlarged perspective assists us in appreciating better the work that we do. We may be doing a small piece of job in our everyday work. Whatever it is that we are doing that is our calling in life. It can begin to have a purpose if we look at that calling that assists the entire humanity. So whether you're uh, sweeping a street or cleaning a house or cooking or doing whatever little jobs that you do, it impacts on a much larger group on, on your environment, on the people you are living with, on, the, on everything else in life. And so when you get that perspective, you begin to realize how important that little job is. It is not just a job that we think, uh, you know, is uh, menial and dispensable. It is an indispensable job. And now when we live in the, through these times of shutdown, we begin to realize how important those little things that people do around us are so important and so significant. And they are part of the sustainable development that we talk about. So Gandhiji, you know, one of his central features was that we must respect every job, everything that a person does no matter how menial, how small we think it is. Because in reality, when we begin to think of it and when we contextualize it in the bigger picture, we find that it is, it takes a very important role in that bigger picture. And therefore we should respect all jobs and respect all people love all people and begin to understand and appreciate humanity, our environment, the animals, the universe, everything that surrounds us because without it, we cannot be living today. We, our life will be nothing. And living in this time of COVID-19, we begin to realize how important that environment, that field that we play games on, those people that we play with, um, the keeping the environment clean, the people who do that work, how important it is in our lives. And it makes our life a better life. So let us begin to think about that and to cherish everything that we uh, see around us and begin to see the purpose in our lives itself, in what we are doing and what we are promoting. So each one of us is doing an important work. Let us not forget that whatever we are doing, it is important and therefore, we need to cherish it, be proud of what we are doing, do it well, and go forward in um, looking after our world, our environment, and everybody in our environment. I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share this with you. Thank you very much, Ilaji. And is it a mere coincidence that today is also World Health Earth Day? Today is yes. Earth Day, which we are celebrating. And uh, 
uh, what an appropriate uh, time to listen to you on this day when uh, everything revolves around saving ourselves and saving saving the planet earth uh, so friends now you can please raise your hands if you want to ask your question yourself or type in your questions uh, we already have a comment and a question uh, uh, which says it is an honor listening to ela ji every word you spoke and all points are more relevant today than ever before for the entire world you are so right that gandhi ji connected so powerfully with the youth and all but today we see a big disconnect as you said between development change advocates and youth and common people how do we bridge this gap because you said that we have somehow failed somewhere that we are not able to involve the youth and uh, connect with them and i agree personally i agree with you ela ji because uh, i think we have we as parents and we as elders or maybe there is uh, 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 there is no leadership they are they can look up to uh, there is a loss of that that we have somewhere failed down the line so how do we bridge that gap so um firstly for me you know one of the things that gandhi ji did during his lifetime was to listen to the youth for instance you know when we talk about economy of permanence he um he wasn't an economist he was a lawyer he knew nothing about economy so he connected with um you know kumarappa mm -hmm. and kumarappa ji was an economist a leading economist at that time a very young person he connected with him and he said so these are some of my ideas about his own holistic view and so on and he asked Kum kumarappa ji to translate that into economic terms which is what he did when he wrote the book uh, economy of permanence and so gandhi ji was prepared to learn from the young people he didn't go to the young people and say to them look this is what it is and this is what you must you know listen to so his interpretation wasn't one of authority he uh, you know interacted with people he learned from people and he said okay these are my views but you give me your views let's talk about it and maybe you can influence me and i can influence you and that is how he was able to relate to the youth unfortunately i think in today's time because many of us are already quite old and have become authoritarian and everybody looks on us as if we've got the answers to everything which we don't have we are also learning and as knowledge grows maybe the younger people have other knowledge i mean for instance if you look at computers and you look at telephones i have to go to my grandchildren to learn about it if i have a problem my little grandchildren are the ones who come and teach me how to connect you know how to make it uh, right so i think that that is a problem that uh, makes that disconnect so let's now approach the children with respect and respect for their knowledge whatever knowledge they have and let's sit and talk to them and develop their knowledge uh enhance their knowledge with our own uh wisdom or whatever we would call it but also learn from them to enhance our own behavior our own thinking i think that interaction is necessary in the today so intergenerational interaction uh positive interaction where we learn from each other 
it's not a one way interaction. Thank you. So, all my young crowd, please, we have to interact. So, please come up with your comments or questions. You can ask or type in. This is one big opportunity where at least Ilaji will break, at least try to break that intergenerational gap. So, please make use of it. Uh, Mudit, you want to ask a question? Yes, uh, if yes, I may. Mudit. Yes. Thank you so much. First of all, Elaji, it's an honor to be uh, listening to you. I was just starting to read one of Gandhiji's book that I have with me. Uh, it is by Ramchandra Guha. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, my question to you, yeah. uh, ma'am, is uh, in this time of lockdown, we have seen that the environment is beginning to heal. And uh, in around 15 to 20 days, uh, there is a lot of positive effect which wasn't seen despite the best of the efforts in past two to three decades. If Gandhiji was alive, my question is if Gandhiji was alive and he had to push uh, the environmental changes, what would have been his way in the current time? And uh, what probably we can do to probably have a couple of weeks similar shutdown every year so that we can let the nature heal. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a very important question, which everybody is asking. I mean, you see uh, suddenly the sky is clearer than before because we don't have so many planes flying in the sky. There are more birds coming out. The water is uh, clearer. So, yes, the environment is healing. The earth is healing. Um, Gandhiji in his time, he had already warned us that some of the ways in which we tamper with the environment, with our earth, are destructive. And apart from looking at shutdown occasionally, I think what we need to look at is how we are depleting the environment. What are some of the things that we are doing like overconsumption, overconsumption of resources of the earth, you know, trying to uh, mine as much as we can, take out all the resources of the earth as much as we can, uh, fly around unnecessarily, um, you know, all that movement. In Gandhiji's time, he said we shouldn't have railways because we're carrying diseases. That's what he had said at one time. And many people laughed at him. And, um, you know, today <clears throat> we, um, we don't uh, regard that as a serious thing that he had said. But um, when we look at the, the way we pollute the environment because of the traffic, on the roads, just a simple thing, the traffic on the roads and how it pollutes our environment. So how can we change our habits so that we don't have so many cars on the road, so much of transportation? Can we kind of look at sharing, sharing transport, looking at um, walking more? We have lost you, Elaji. Please can you hear? Yeah, yes, yes. We could hear you just now. Okay. But yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what I was saying is that I uh, um talked about many things and maybe we think about now. As we go forward, we you know, for instance. Our president here has said that life is not going to be the same after COVID-19. Once it's gone, we are not going to see the same things being done, life as usual. 
there is going to be a definite change, changing everything around us, the economy, the way we live, and so on. So we need to think how that change is going to occur. And historically, if we see, you know, there was um, a huge uh, problem after the Hiroshima took place. The whole world was, you know, um, absolutely shocked at what happened. But how much did we change? And in what way did we change since Hiroshima? And that's just one example. In history, there are many examples. And sometimes people have changed for the better, very seldom. In many cases, people have changed for the worse. If you look at Hiroshima, it shocked us. But since Hiroshima, how many countries have produced bombs? How many countries have produced even more um, you know, potent or worse bombs than the one that was exploded over Hiroshima. So we haven't learned from that lesson. We are doing just the opposite. We, what is the point in producing and spending so much of money keeping those uh, bombs? Uh, and when are we going to use them? Why keep them? And are we going to have, are we going to really uh, explode a bomb like that on somebody, on some country? Who do we harm? We don't only harm that other country, we harm all of humanity by doing that. That is what happened at Hiroshima, but we haven't learned that lesson. So now with COVID-19, we need to begin to think and think of how do we want to make the changes and begin to, the young people must go around and get other people to see, begin a discussion, start the whole process of change. The process must start now, not later. Thank you. And I just wanted to share that uh... Uh, Mudit is an engineer, engineer with Indian Oil and who has worked since his, for many years uh, working on Gandhian principles and he's connected with Asha Parivar also. And Mudit, I would like you to share with the young audience we have today what brought you to be part of a social change and interested in social change. Thank you so much, uh, Shobhaji. I, I don't feel I am fit to be replying to any such questions in this forum where we have likes of Ella Gandhi. But still, um, uh, I would say that uh, I had read about Gandhi, but I started practicing or probably realizing those principles only when I met someone of the likes of Dr. Sandeep Pandey, who is a living Gandhian. And when I saw him practicing those things. So for me personally, it was a transformation when I saw someone rather than reading about someone. And when I saw him practicing those things day in and day out, it really affected me deeply. And then when I got back to reading Gandhi, it added the effect and made me change in certain ways. Thank you so much. Okay. And how, how do you engage with the youth? Uh, I keep engaging with my office colleagues. So whenever we have discussions about whenever they come up with plans of purchasing something new or Whenever I think that I am uh, over consuming, I try to check that. And whenever we have discussions, I try to bring back uh, Gandhian views into that discussion and how uh, how a person who was born way back was able to think about things which are affecting us still now. And, uh, and I have seen uh, surprisingly that in past five, six years, the kind of circles that I have, there are more people who are beginning to realize the importance of Gandhi. Right, yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to share here today, Ilaji just now mentioned Hiroshima. Of course, there are uh, so many things we can talk about related to atomic energy and the atom bomb. Uh, but uh, my personal experience, uh, I have been a teacher for 30 long years. I taught physics to 17, 18 year olds. And I, while I was teaching uh, the chapter on nuclear fission, 
I would just ask my students the question that should India have the atom bomb? And the answer was in unison, yes, ma'am, we should. And then my next question was why? And again, it was a common answer to protect us from Pakistan. And then I said, well, after reading whatever the science is behind that, if you drop a bomb on Pakistan, don't you think you will also get destroyed in the process? It, 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 even if you think you are, it's used as a weapon and it is such a dangerous weapon. Now, then there were meek replies, no ma'am, but you know, mentally we will feel safe if we have a weapon in the house. But I think that is how the discussion started. And I said, you don't have to believe what I'm saying, but just think over it. And at the end of the day, while learning that chapter on nuclear fission, uh, most of them agreed that, yes, I think they, they thought it's a waste of money and resources, and it's really not going to really not going to protect us in any way, unless we want to destroy ourselves. Uh, so sorry for that digression. And we have <laughs> another, another comment, uh, which says, so true that our false pride and ego is preventing us from learning from young and fellow common people. And this is especially true for our bureaucrats and politicians and everyone. So the person who has written promises from today, Ilaji, I promise to be more conscious of uh, not having a false ego and sense of know it all to prevent me from learning. And uh, I think I would also like to add that, that our whole life is a process of learning, unlearning and relearning. And uh, mm -hmm. we have learned so many things from Ilaji today. And sometimes we need to keep on talking over it over and over again. And I have felt that uh, discussions and dialogues are very important in life. Because very often yes. we believe in something in our minds, but maybe we feel we are the lone voice or we are too scared to voice our opinion. So, and I have seen that. I have been talking to uh, old women about uh, basically about too many I think use, useless rituals which we have, and they are all very uh, gender centric, directed against women in our day to day lives, uh, in our marriage rights, and all. And I asked those women, and they said, Yes, we totally agree with you, but we don't have the courage to speak out. So mm -hmm. I think dialogues give us a platform to speak out. And as you said, Gandhiji, listen to everyone, and, that, that, and that's a very um, important and a very difficult uh, trait also, because uh, we don't want to listen to others. We don't want to listen to another person's point of view. So that dialogue, I think, is very important. And I hope uh, the young managers, we, we, managers in the making we have today, they are there for, ready for the dialogue and we more, more questions and clarifications if they need from them. So more questions coming up, I hope. Yes. Are all of you very sleepy? I don't think it's, I know it's hot here and it's 2.30 past 2.30, but please wake up. I don't think it's a very rare chance we have got to speak with Elaji today. Or are you so spellbound that you don't want to open your mouths? Please wake up. And Elaji, you were like, you were mentioning about too many cars being used. And that is where that... Uh, Working to the, together, I think, comes into play. If we have a very good public transport system, and I think some of the countries at least are going for that, uh, why, why do we need a car? car? If, uh, if we have good roads and if we have cycle tracks on the road, right now the traffic is so bad, it's, so, it's almost impossible to even cross a road, the situation, what mm -hmm. is there. So I think if, if there is a public transport system, if there are lanes, People should be, would be encouraged perhaps. And also that, uh, that social distancing. Uh, again, uh, social distancing we are talking of in terms of COVID. I think we should call it physical distancing because in India already there is a lot of social distancing which is there. Uh, the distance between different social classes. So yes. we, here I think uh, owning a car is a, a matter of elitism or a matter of pride. And if we break that, that, that is not really which makes us a, a big person or a powerful person. Uh, I think these things also go along with because here we are, we are already, I think we have to um, 
sort of get down with social distancing as is in india uh, physical distancing in the in times of covid yes okay yes yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, another question we have uh, very inspired to learn about the trees planted by gandhi ji 100 years back and still bearing fruit in the phoenix settlement how can we promote local self sufficiency in uh, in times of aggressive marketing i think you know gandhi ji said that uh, local development is the most important you know uh, especially when we look at power the power structure we look at government when we have local government and i think that you know india has actually set a very very good example in kerala because i think the world can learn from that you know they the way they were able to deal with this corona virus um it is an amazing experience and what i read there is that it was only successful because they already had very strong local structures in their local municipalities or local areas and gandhi ji wrote extensively about gram swaraj so if we apply that principle of gram swaraj then you know that principle will make local self sufficiency local development um you know a central part of um the the government of a country and in that way we can uh devolve uh the economy in such a way that it's not centralized at the city level but it goes down to the people as well so what what we are seeing at the moment and uh, throughout the world is that one or two people in the world or in our country country have access to all the wealth or at least the major portion say 80% of the wealth is localized in a few individuals i think in the world they call they say it's 1% or something like that to control the major portion of the wealth of the world and only the other smaller portion is divided amongst the rest of the people the rest of the 99% or so now that is the pattern in every country if that pattern was convoluted which is happening at the moment because we are talking about solidarity uh you know the funds that we are collecting from people now is a solidarity fund in order to help the disadvantaged if we take advantage of that and say okay you are able to contribute this towards the welfare of all these people now under this situation going forward can you not contribute towards the well-being permanent well-being of all these people not giving out charities but giving them better homes giving them better incentives to be able to do things for themselves and be able to earn their own livelihood and that is a possibility if we look at how we decentralize so i think that that was like gandhian idea which i'm sharing but maybe as an economist as a physicist you might know more and be able to look at that in a better sort of in the in light of Kumar Pandey's uh, book you know the economy of permanence not economy of consumption which is what we are living in at the moment thank you
Mihir has a question. Mihir, would you like to ask yourself? Would be great if you ask yourself, if possible. He has sent a question. I'll read it otherwise. But yes, Mihir. Hello. Yes, hello. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. This is Mihir. So um, yes. I had a question regarding the current issue that we face related to poverty. So uh, in terms of sustainable development. how do you see this issue of poverty affecting uh, the way we move forward because uh, there are uh, because in the future we could uh, certainly face uh, a time where we have to face a trade off between whether we allocate resources to the poor or do we save these resources for our future generations keeping in mind the sustainable development uh, because recently with growing uh, growing economic activities there has been a divide between the rich, rich and poor which has been increasing so this is a problem that we could certainly face in the future so how do you uh, how do you see this problem okay uh there are two things i don't have a concrete answer okay not an expert economist but two things that i see in our own situation because we also looked at that issue um the one is that you give handouts at the present moment 6 months later you've given everything that you have uh, collected people are you know making collections for parcels grocery parcels and so on and they are giving it to the um, to the poor now we give that out and we're not looking at 6 months later what is going to happen to them are they going to be back on the street are they going to be homeless for instance in durban uh, you know the uh, there's a group of different religious um, people who came together and we looked at 1700 people who are homeless who sleep on the streets and we said that for them to take care of themselves in the present position and not be uh, you know infected by uh, this virus how do we uh, look after them so we decided with the city council's help and the provincial uh, assistance we um made separate uh, places where we gave them accommodation and we had 50 people in each accommodation because with 50 people you can have distance control you can uh, you know make sure that the hygiene is observed and all the necessary steps to prevent the virus from infecting them is um in place so each place has got 50 people and we've got volunteers who go there and help and look after them throughout the day but that is not going to be sustained after the close down is over because all those people who have volunteered are going to go back to work so we haven't got a team that is a team that's going to be sustained and this is what we were looking at how do we do something that is going to make sure that in the future we um, are able to sustain it and so some of the things we said is why not get unemployed people and provide them with skills so that they can become assistance to these people why not provide a shelter which can be a permanent shelter for these people rather than a temporary shelter even if it is not you know brick and mortar but a permanent shelter which can keep them housed give them a little shelter that each person can live in so going forward we can begin to have discussions on how that can be done so that it can be sustained so we have two things one is to look at the present need 
not to say, okay, stop now. We are going to provide something six months later with the money that we've collected. Six months later, those people might be dead. Like I saw a story of a little girl who walked for three days and died because of lack of food and so on. Um, so, you know, that can happen. So you've got to look at the present, the right now, the urgent need, and plan for the future as well. So there has to be a balance between the two, long term and short term. बेटर Uh, we are just waiting to see if any virtual hand is being raised or anyone is unmuting her or or his mic Ila ji, just one last take-home message from you. Just summing up from uh, some of the questions and comments which you have heard, and just in short, can we have a take-home message from you? Hmm. I think uh, we need to uh, continue the dialogue, uh, not just with me, but amongst yourselves. Yes. and to think about uh, how going forward we can change things how what are the ways in which we can change our lives and the lives of other people in order to create a better world so i think that that is what i would like to leave you with gandhi and thought will certainly help let's read more of his books uh i think uh, ramchandra guha's book is a very interesting book but also there are other books on little things like gram swaraj like um, and those are small books um you know they not books like um uh, the guha book um and they can be very interesting and looking at um very important issues like decentralization of government looking at um how the village economy can flourish and so on so we could look at things like that and begin to talk about it and come up with ideas and i'll just tell you one little story that uh you know i was told about uh, south africa I uh, just yesterday and this is that there was a little shop which used to sell um you know clothes baby clothes and things like that and uh, because of the covid-19 that shop had to close down and uh, what they did the proprietors of that shop they had contact with farmers very uh, in that area and so they made contact with the farmers and changed the shop into a place where they can now um transport food from the shop from this little baby shop to a food shop where they can begin to provide communities with fresh produce straight from the farm through the shop to uh, the community so looking at you know just imaginative ways in which people can make little changes in order to meet the situation that we are faced with 
and meets the needs of the community. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Ilaji, for this very, very stimulating talk, which actually has left all our audience speechless and spellbound. And uh, you have given us enough food for thought for many, many days and months and years to come. Uh, so happy learning, e learning. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, and wish you a very healthy life ahead. Okay, so I think there has been a bouquet of thanks for Ilaji and uh, happy learning, relearning and unlearning to all our listeners. Uh, and just a reminder that we are meeting again day after tomorrow at 3 p.m. India time to interact with Anand Grover, a noted human rights lawyer. And goodbye till then. And once again, Ilaji, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. And goodbye.